If half of what I said, if a fourth of what I said before is true and right, then it's going to certainly have something to say about how to be reading it. And that's what I want to talk about now. And um, this is how it happens. The Honeybee Queen seeks out a drone comet. Um, it patrols in a path we often call the drone congregation area. And the Virgin Queen seeks out these drone congregation areas, flies through them, and rapidly will mate with several of these males. On average, a queen will do this about 15 times during the first or second week of her life. And then it's over, and the semen is stored, stored in her spermatheca, and she uses that to bother all of her progeny from that point on. Well, this has become known as a very important juncture in the evolution of social bees. And I'm going to show you a few titles here just to kind of underscore how much attention this is now getting. Uh, the Evolution of Female Multiple Mating and Social Hymenoptera. This is a paper from 2003. And, and these authors are highlighting that diseases and pests were one of the main evolutionary drivers that forced these primitive bees to start practicing multiple mating. So it's, it's not too outrageous to think that American fowl brood, European fowl brood, chalk brood, uh, these, were, but these were the reasons why the honeybee queen became uh, polyandrous. More recently, uh, there's been some papers that have looked at this a little more closely, like Dave Tarpey at NC State, Tom Seeley, who you had up here last year to speak, that have shown colonies have lower disease incidence uh, the more polyandrous their queens are. And you can see how this is a continuum, isn't it? You can have queens that are more or less polyandrous than one another, depending on how many males they have mated with. Uh, Heather Matilla, who's also spoke here, I believe, um, she published this part of her dissertation with Tom Seeley, How Genetic Diversity in Honeybee Colonies Increases Productivity and Fitness. Now keep in mind here, this is natural history we're talking about. Uh, what is productivity and what is fitness? Well, this is reproduction. And these authors were able to show that colonies that are more polyandrous have a greater likelihood of issuing a successful swarm. In other words, a successful reproduction. Well, I was, I was interested in this, and I was interested in trying to capture this natural phenomenon in a way that could be amplified and exaggerated and delivered to the beekeeping industry. And so I, I had the good fortune to um, be funded by a grant from the United Kingdom uh, to do a two-year sabbatical in York, which is where the little drop pin is there, right close to Leeds. Uh, this is the National Bee Unit of the United Kingdom, uh, comparable to our Beltsville. This is where they have regulatory and uh, disease and research on honeybee health uh, that's carried on here. I always told them it looked like the headquarters of the villain of the James Bond movie. <laughs> Uh, this is the, uh, one of my co-workers, uh, Mike Brown, who is the director of the NBU on your left, and Giles Budge, the chief scientist, on your right. York is also the home of all sorts of delights unique to Europe. Uh, York Minster, one of the biggest cathedrals in Europe, is there. Uh, York Shear is also the home of those of you who have read the James Harriet novels, All Creatures Great and Small. You know, this is, where, this is where he practiced his veterinary career. It really is as beautiful as he describes. Um, nearby, in the moors of North Yorkshire, they have the famous heather honey. And heather is the subject of British-style migratory beekeeping. Uh, beekeepers from all over the island will move their bees up into the heather moors in August. And it's a beautiful purple bloom. And it's a thixotropic honey. They were strapped for moving, they were not strapped for bears. Yeah, they, they don't let bears in. <laughs> um, thixotropic honey, though, that's interesting. We don't think we have any of that here in this country, but it's a, it's a gelatinous honey. It's really thick. You gotta, um, you gotta kind of stir it before you can extract it. It's, it's really quite a pain in the neck to work with, but you can get a premium price for it, too. I promised you that I would show you a growler louse. 
And here we go. The National Bee Unit um, maintains an apiary for the sole purpose of maintaining growler lice. This is something only the British would think of. <laughs> but sure enough, they have a dedicated apiary. They have about six or seven colonies, and they've never treated them with miticides. And they, they keep these little lice. You see this queen here? Is that little bump on her at the top? She actually has about five or six of these little lice crawling all over. It kind of sounds creepy to us. But um, I think of them as those little birds in Africa that pick parasites off their favorite rhinoceros. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the same thing in the scale of the bee. Uh, these are flies that have lost their wings in geologic time. And they just make a living off of scrounging off of queen bees and scrounging around in the combs. Their only economic liability is those little lines I told you about. But they can sometimes make underneath the cappings of comb honey. And you'll find in some of the old literature, uh, they will talk about the brow as if it's a real severe pest because it blemishes our otherwise perfect comb honey. And um, you'll find recommendations that you'll put freeze your comb honey and uh, kill these little varmints so they don't swivel around into your cappings. And again, if you're a British person, winning that silver cup at the National Honey Show is what it's all about. <laughs> right, well, let's, before we launch into polyandry, I want to pause a minute to kind of make sure that we're all on solid ground of what the current state of the art is of honeybee breeding. So let's think here for a minute. Um, the breeding designs that are available to us, um, what is most commonly written and what is most commonly practiced. Uh, these really boil down to a variation of one of these three. The maternal selection open mated scheme, an inbred hybrid scheme, or a closed population scheme. If, if there's any breeding done in this country in any significant commercial scale, it's done with the first bullet. What is this? I'm a beekeeper. I like this hive. This hive right here, I like it. It's made a lot of honey, it's gentle, it's everything I want. I'm going to graft larvae from this hive. So you graft larvae from this hive, you put them out in mating nukes, and somebody mates with them. You take those dollars and you use them. That's it. Now you know already just how sloppy that is. Well, there's all sorts of reasons why this slides slop compounded on top of slop. Because first of all, because they multiply mate, and there's a diversity of pasture lines into that roof, when you're out there grafting, it may be one patch line, two maybe, who is responsible for that fantastic honey crop. And so here you are grafting, and maybe only two, one in every five eggs that you're grafting actually has a breath of a chance of having the character that you're interested in in the first place. So there's a big chunk of slop. Now you're going to just open mate them. So you see how imprecise it is? So for years and years, now, this is nothing new to beekeepers. I mean, breeders have known this forever. And they say, well, that's just how honeybee breeding is. And that's why it's so hard to breed. And, and they're right. It, it, the open mating, multiple mating strategy of the honeybee queen is really difficult to work with if you're interested in selecting for X. This is not a surprise. I, you don't need me to tell you this. This is, this is old news. Well, a second bullet up there, we'll just hang on that, because we're going to be coming back to that one. The second bullet here is the inbred hybrid scheme. It has been here in this country. Many of you may not remember it, though. It was the old day at midnight and starline uh, bees. Uh, I remember them back in the 70s. I think by the 80s, I don't think they were selling them anymore. But this was a true hybrid line, two hybrid lines. And just like in, in plant breeding, you have two parent lines that are themselves heavily inbred. They're, they're nasty little things. They're in, 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 in biology, inbred organisms tend to not be as, as vigorous as hybridized organisms. This is another old thing we've known forever. So how do you make a hybrid for commercial agriculture? You take one super inbred parental line and another super inbred parental line, and you cross them, and you get this fantastic hybrid. And this is what the Midnights and the Star Lines were that they managed for several years with the breeding station down in Florida. You get a vigorous bee. 
Well, that's quote marks around the word vigorous. But it is not selected for anything. Okay, this is a bid for big variation. We get a bee that's robust and generous, but it has no special character in particular that it has been bred for. Um, for reasons I don't fully understand, they didn't drop these two lines, and I don't believe they're available anymore. The third and most sophisticated historic scheme is the closed population plan, which was uh, developed by uh, Harry Laidlaw and uh, uh, Rob Page back in the 1980s. And it's, it's pretty sophisticated. It recognizes that if you continue selecting for something, with the honeybees in particular, you get some inbreeding inevitably begins to happen. And in the case of inbreeding, there is a peculiar trait that surfaces that always happens and is unique to the honeybees. They get spotty brood. Spotty brood. Now there's a reason for this. You have read and heard that gender in honeybees is governed by whether they're mated or not, right? You get full dose of chromosomes, 32 of them, you become a female. If you have only half of that, you got 16, you become a male, right? Well, yes, but it is a little more nuanced than that. There really is genes that control gender. And if you have those genes such that there is two of them that show up that are the same form, or let's say dominant A and dominant A, those individuals become male. If they are heterozygous at that site, they become a female and everything's normal. But if they're homozygous, if they're the same alleles of that gene, they're male. So there really are diploid males <coughs> in the order Hymenoptera. But you never see them because the worker bees eat them. <laughs> Those homozygous males get eaten and they disappear from the population and you're never seen when they're inconsequential. But for a beekeeper, this is a real handy tool for you to know if you're getting inbreeding because your brood becomes spotty. There's a large fraction of it that is skipped. And you think, oh, my queen's running out of sperm. So no, it's nothing like that at all. She's just laying a lot of homozygous inbred eggs, including the gene locus. So, hang on that. Um, Harry Laidlaw and Rob Page said, okay, so if we're going to breed for X with the honeybee, we have to simultaneously do something about this inbreeding problem and getting spotty brood. How can we have our cake and eat it too? Well, here's how they did it. They said, here's the closed population breeding scheme. Take 50 colonies. You want at least 50 there to be a viable population. And uh, select for X, Y, Z, whatever it is you want. You will take the top 10 producing daughters from these initial generations, and you will rear them, and then you will instrumentally inseminate them, the top 10% daughters, you will instrumentally inseminate them with all of the semen of the entire population, including the 90% that didn't make the cut. Does that seem like kind of a step backward? Think about it, here's what's happening. You've got your top 10% daughters, Okay, this is the character I want. I'm going to graft from it two steps forward. Okay, now I'm going to inseminate them with all of the drones. There's one step back. And they said, yeah, you're right. It's two steps forward and one step back. So it's a compromise scheme. You're going to select for the thing you want maternally, but you're going to breed them with all the males in the population to try to slow down the evolution of inbreeding. They actually did the theoretical work on this and showed that you could realize about, oh, what was it? I think it was 20 generations before the system would begin to break down and you'd start having uncontrollable inbreeding. But you know, for 20 generations, for most of us, that's, that's, that's a viable, I, I would do something with a 20 year horizon. Our mortgages are more than that. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is still considered a viable breeding scheme. Um, Ed mentioned this morning one of his questions about Sue Covey and Marlis Spivak, and this is what they do. They, they are the big champions of the closed population breeding scheme because it's the best thing that we have out there to select for X. A targeted character that you want to breed for, the closed population scheme is the way to go. Okay, let's get on here. 
with this scheme, when you're selecting for X, it is important that you measure and not just guess at things. If you're measuring for honey production, you want to weigh colonies. If you're measuring for brood production and population growth, you want to measure brood. If you're, it's defensiveness, you want to measure defensiveness. Um, this is a method we used at LSU, and we would drag these um, red leather patches across the top of cones with a stopwatch and count the number of stings on them. It had to be red, had to be red to excite their anger. Y'all don't believe that, do you? Um, now, hygienic is another one of those characters. It's kind of, you know, the stock price is pretty high on hygienic right now. And this can be measured in the field. It's a simple assay that measures how good the bees cleaning out dead brood. Uh, you would not want to use actual AFB. You, you know, we don't want that. So we use a proxy method by freeze killing the brood, which isn't a contagious way of killing brood. So what we do now, uh, this is our earlier stuff. We were using uh, flashing. Now we just use PVC pipe. Schedule 40 PVC, and we screw a section of PVC pipe into open or a sealed brew. We throw in about a pint of a liquid nitrogen, and it bubbles and pops and instantly freezes the brew just within seconds. And you take it away, and you see that frozen circle there on the top right. Put it back in the colony, and come back after 24 hours and count uh, the number of cells remaining. In this example, uh, the, the colony is not really all that good at hygienic behavior. They left behind a lot of dead cells, whereas this one is expressing 100% hygienic behavior. So it's a proxy method of testing this behavior. So you'd want to graph from this queen if hygienic is what you were interested in. Uh, mites, shall we say what to do about that? Count them? Let me show you um, a project. We got funding from the uh, National IPM program a few years back to try to use the closed population scheme in Georgia as a demonstration to select for everything that beekeepers would want. I want to go through this with you, and I want you to stay with me because it's going to include a little bit of the math. Because I want you to see what it really takes to select for X with, with the honeybee, okay? First of all, Normal stuff, you want to have standardized colonies of equal strength. I think you all have Jamie Ellis come speak to you. Uh, this is when Jamie was a postdoc with me. He's the tall, skinny guy right there. And these are the characters that we decided to go for. And there's a lot of them. There's six of them. Which right off the bat is very ambitious. Because the more you select four, the less you select for any one. So we, we understood this right off the bat. The way we measured, we wanted to select for low varroa, high hygienic, high brood, high honey production, <laughs> high gentleness, and high solidness. Now, we selected criteria that had at least something in the literature to suggest that they could be selected for. Not all characters are equally heritable, but all of these in this case were. We have the citations here to suggest that. This value in this column right here is a weighting factor where we asked ourselves, how much importance do we want to put on these characters? Well, we assigned two-tenths of our weight to Varroa, two-tenths to Hygienic, a tenth to Brood, and Honey, and Gentleness. But we assigned the biggest weighting factor to Solidness, because we really didn't want to have inbreeding. We wanted to be making advances on the things that we wanted while trying to minimize inbreeding as much as possible. These numbers have to add up to one. The, uh, that's correct. I'll show you in a minute how we measured for that. Um, well, let me go ahead and tell you. The question was solidness. How did we measure that? I think I have a picture coming up, but I may not. We took a piece of cardboard and we counted 10 cells down the top, 10 cells across the bottom, so there are 100 cells. And we would lay that over patches of brood and count the number of skips. By using 100, you immediately have a percentage. You don't have to do any math. So we would do about 10 measurements of this and come up with an average solidness of 95%. Now, I want, here's where um, I want you to follow. This is the part where people get, this is the part where people lose it when it comes to selection. What I'm showing you here is a real authentic line of data from our, our data set. 
what you see is a generation one, colony two, the varroa mites, there's one mite. That's pretty good. If I were going for mites, I'd say, yeah, that's great. Hygienic behavior is 43%. Well, that's not so good. I, I don't really like that. Brood, 3,500. Well, about something to compare, I don't really know. Honey, 4.2 kilograms. Stings, no stings. That's good. Solidness, 71. Yeah, I'd like it a little better than that. How would you select this column? Is it a keeper or is it a reject? Well, there's a second problem with this. You're not comparing apples and apples. You're comparing apples and avocados because those numbers are just all over the place. You've got whole numbers, you've got percentages. So this, this is a mess. It has to be tweaked a little bit. Now, if any of you ever work with Excel, uh, there is a procedure where you can normalize the data, is what it's called. And what Excel does is calculates the average for each character, and then it assigns a positive or a negative to every individual character, depending on how it compares to the mean. So it's half of the values for Varroa, for example, are going to be negative, half of them will be positive. You're, you're always going to be on one side or the other. You're either going to be above the average or you're going to be below the average. So everybody gets a value, either plus or minus. And Excel will calculate this for you. So once you have normalized the data with Excel, you can now look a little more intelligently at each of these lines of data. And Varroa was, was on the good side. Uh, hygienic was on the low side. It was lower than average. Brood was lower than average. Honey, above average. Stings, yeah, it was lower than average. That's good. Solidness, lower than average. So you gotta go through this normalization step. Then you have to come up with a score, which is an index. An index has no unit, by the way. It's not degrees, it's not temperature, it's nothing. It's just a, a fake number that you make up. And here's how we calculated our index. We assigned a minus to those characters that we did not like. As they got more varroa, this was a bad thing. So we gave it a negative sign against the six tenths, the normalized score, times that weighting factor that we came up with. We add all of these, giving them negatives for things we don't like, positives for things we do, and this colony ends up with an index of minus. The pack, it was cold. It did not make it. Kind of like a slide. <coughs> Oh, the question, there we go. There's a selection. It is simply the sum of the transferred z-score times the weighting factor that you assign to that. Straight out of your animal husbandry reading books. Okay, once we have that z-score, now we can start doing something. We can pick our top 10%. And we could make them back to the bottom 100% and do all of that soup cookie stuff that I was telling you about. But we had to do this to get the colony to make the basis to making a decision. And now I get to show you our results. We did this for five years, and our hygienic behavior was kind of underwhelming, wasn't it? Our first year, we thought, man, we're onto something. But you know, the final three years just kind of played out. Brood, brood was the only thing that showed any hint of an improvement for all this effort. Uh, brood solidness, I guess this is okay. I mean, we sort of kept things level. We covered right around the 86 or 7 percent mark. Um, but nobody gets too excited about maintaining solidness. You don't really write home about that, do you? Uh, but Varroa, good lord. Here's a train wreck. Well, um, we, we put a lot of effort into this. You can imagine we had a lot of funding, we had manpower, we had everything right. Um, if there was ever a time that this would have worked, this would have been it. Okay? I mean, we were really going at this right. So it was about this time, you can see the dates there, 2007. I started thinking about, gosh, you know, is my experience with this big federally funded breeding project, is my experience anomalous? 
is it out of the norm? And I, I, I'm consoling myself, okay? You see where this is going, I'm rationalizing. Well, I'm not, not, I'm not that bad, am I? There's, there's others that's not been so good either on there. And I gotta think, well, you know, darn it, um, I'm not so sure that this is an anomaly. I got to thinking, you know, where in fact are the success stories? Um, I perhaps would not think about this as much as I did if I had not gone through this experience that I've, that I've laid out for you. But I began at this time to start coming under the influence of some of this other literature on polyandry and the superorganism. I began to wonder if maybe the whole selection-based paradigm toward the honeybee may be barking up the wrong tree. Just maybe. Just maybe. Think about that. So henceforward, let's, let's fast forward now to uh, 2012 and uh, the beginning of my British sabbatical. The nice thing about the British sabbatical is it was in England, which is a wonderful place. The beer is really good. <laughs> um, lots of great footpaths. Um, but really the best thing of it, it didn't cost you all a dime. This was all on Her Majesty's nickel. Pen <laughs> you should say, shillings. Um, it was a British government grant. I was able to go over there and spend uh, two seasons working on this project. And we were looking at this, this literature from Tom Seeley, Dave Tarpey, and Heather Matilla, and these others, and, and realizing that the polyandry is kind of what the bee has done with genetics. The bee has not tried to narrow itself and create colonies that are specialized for anything. Um, to the contrary, they've almost gone to great pains to do the opposite of that. You know, cast as wide a genetic net as possible. Um, should we look at this more closely? So we used instrumental insemination to exaggerate natural rates of polyandry. We designated 15 colonies as our drone source colonies, and they had no selection of applied to them whatsoever. Uh, they were just simply 15 drone colonies. We had three experimental treatments. Queens that were inseminated with 15 drones, 30 drones, or 60 drones. And um, I was giving a talk down in London uh, one year about this uh, early on. And this little guy in the back of the room, he raises his hands very slowly. Pardon me, but won't she pop? It's <laughs> 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 not a bad question. Um, <laughs> so what you, what you, here's how you do this. You, you collect all the semen and you, you express it into the little Eppendorf tube, and you add an equal amount of saline, physiological saline, and you mix it up. And then you draw it back up into your capillary, and then each queen is inseminated with the same volume. So the volume is always the same. It's always eight microliters, uh, but that semen mixture is you know, different numbers of males fit into each one of it. Now, um, bear with me here a second. We were not particularly interested in genetic diversity, per se, we were interested in polyandry. Now the two go hand in hand, but, but for our purposes we wanted to be very plain on what we were trying to do. That's why we had only 15 drone source colonies. And for those queens that got 15, they got one queen from one drone from this one, one from this one, one from this one, one. Those that got 30 got two from this one, two, two, two. Those that got 60 got four, 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 four. So it was the same finite universe of male sperm, just different numbers of them. Now from our previous lecture, you know that these drones, even from the same queen, are not clones of one another. Remember that little crossing over dance that I did? So you're still getting a lot of genetic diversity, but we, we wanted to be very precise in our definition when we expressed that we were looking for different numbers of males. But hopefully, we will get, in fact, higher genetic diversity as polyandry increased that we were not being presumptive about that. We then set up our uh, full number of colonies. We had, I think, 24 the first year. We had roughly 24 or 25 colonies um, each year in the end of the day after we had all of our, our die-outs. And uh, we had to wait about six weeks after we established these queens so that their progeny would turn over. The 
old inmates had to die and the new progeny come online. All right, we're interested in mites. And from here on, the bars go from 15, 30, and 60 across this x-axis here. There is a big variation in these data, but the trajectory are really nice. We have a decrease in mite levels by orders of magnitude as polyandry increased from 15 to 60. My PhD student, Brett, is, uh, as we speak, he's replicating this work uh, in Athens. So we're gonna have uh, two sets of data to compare on both sides of the Atlantic. If you're interested in cone construction, this is a test that Tom Seeley uh, published. And again, this is, we were, we were interested in characters that required coordinated group activity. Remember I talked this morning about um, uh, recruitment, how it is a group activity. And one of the premises behind uh, information um, technology and management in these informed systems is that as you have more specialization in the same system, one would predict that the efficiency of the task would get better. And this was one of Henry Ford's insights in the early days of mechanization. Specialization is expected to result in more efficient processes. So if there ever comes a process, cone construction is one of them. It's also another example of the brain. Um, How does cone construction happen? How's cone construction begin? It has to be in nectar, there's nectar coming in. The glands are activated. The worker has a flake of wax in her mouth, in her four legs, and she's looking for some place to put it. Great. She, she wants to put it somewhere. So she's eager, she's got a lot more of that coming where it came from, so she wants to hurry up and get on with it. And she sticks that square of, of a little flake of beeswax right there. It's got to go somewhere. So she sticks it here. Well, along comes Jane. She's in the same predicament. Oh, man, my clams are hurting. I got hurt. So she, she, where's she going to put it? Oh, well, oh, okay. She sticks it there. At this point, I usually tell beekeeping clubs that something like this happened. It didn't happen here, per se. But it did out there where we had lunch. Somebody set up the chairs and the tables. And I can kind of, I was not there, but I can kind of guess how it went. Someone rolled the table out. They stuck it here. And the next guy came over and they stuck it here. Now, was there someone saying, okay, Bob, come here. Put it here. Okay, Jay, come here, come here, come here. Put your table right here. No. People don't work that way. They just, they put the chair there because the guy before them put it there. And he put it there because he was lazy and didn't want to walk any further. It's another one of those emergent principles that is just fascinating in information-rich <coughs> systems. How, how social insects, they, they do the things they do just out of emergent things that preceded them. It's another one of those so basic that it's dumb sounding to say. That's the stuff of emergent principles in, in social insect colonies. Okay, so they come and they plaster it there because her sister put it there. And the next one comes and plasters it there and 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 there. And guess what? It's the diameter of a bee. It's a miracle. <laughs> well, um, I used to think, okay, it really is a miracle when it comes to the hexagon. Sadly to say, um, my hopes were dashed on that count lately. Uh, Randall Hepburn, who's a distinguished bee scientist from Grahamstown, South Africa. Um, it's where Jamie did his PhD, by the way, with Randall. Randall was able to show that the hexagon is not a deliberate construct of the honeybee, that it is an artifact, an accident of physics. And he said, for example, take bubbles floating on the surface of soapy water, and what do you see at the interface of those bubbles? You see square planes and square geometry. Jim Tu, who's extension in culture to Ohio State, he has the coolest demonstration of this I've ever seen. He takes bath towels and he rolls them up in tight cylinders and then he, he strap, he gets a bunch of them together and straps them with like leather belts and they assume a hexagon. So the hexagon is an emergent principle of physics. It's not a deliberate piece of architecture by our beloved honeybee. 
Anyway, all of this to say that there is a lot of group integration going on in cone construction, and we would predict that as polyandry would increase in a nest, the cone construction efficiency would improve as well. We used an assay that Tom Seeley uh, developed using a strip of starter chrome across the top, leave it in the hive for about three days, and you get some natural cone construction result from that. I did not understand, we would get cone construction even when there was no nectar flow. I don't know how they did this. Maybe they stole it from someplace else, but we got good results even in a dirt. And then you can measure that, and we could derive centimeters of square centimeters of new cone constructed per bee. And we found, again, a trajectory that was interesting and supported our hypothesis. That as polyandry increased, the efficiency by which these bees constructed new cone improved. Brood production. This one was statistically significant. If there's ever a, again, is this a group coordinated behavior? It sure is. There's some individuals that are better at feeding the youngest cohort of larvae. There's some that are really good at cleaning out the cells. There's some that are really good at feeding this age of larvae because the constituents of worker jelly changes as the larvae mature. Again, we would predict that as polyandry increased, you'll have more specialists and these data um, support that. When it came to pollen storage or honey storage per bee, we found no interesting results. It was kind of a, you know, a flat line or else that bump in the middle for honey. So we had nothing really to, to support uh, the work that Heather Matilla had done. She had shown, she and Tom Seeley over here, uh, with her paper that I showed you, an improvement in honey production as, pollen, as polyandry increased, we did not show that. How about the waggle dance? From this morning we know that the waggle dance is another one of those coherent group activities. We would predict the bees would be better at recruiting one another to novel resources as polyandry increased. This was an assay that we developed that I would recommend that you um, try with any of the high school science fair kids in your life. Because it was really fun, it was surprisingly easy, and it gave good results. We would take white combs, white root combs, empty and pre-weighed and dry. And we would insert one of them in the middle of every hive, take out a frame from the center, and put one of these blank, white, pre-weighed combs in the middle of each one. Then we went out into the apiary, and we made a, these big flat trays we got from the horticulture people, filled them with screens to keep the bees from drowning so much, and we poured pink syrup in them with a little bit of honey. Brett, my graduate student, he prefers blue. Uh, and then we sit back and we watch the robbing begin, which it does. And we let them rob for four hours at these robbing stations. And then we would go back, remove those white indicator cones, we had three weighed, and we could count the number of red, pink cells of syrup in there and the number of white unmarked syrup that was in there, take their weight, and from that we calculate the percentage of their foraging effort that had been for the new novel resource that we had just given them. Every time we repeated this, we put the feeding station somewhere else. So it was always new and novel. They had to go out and find it and come back and report it to their nest mates. And we found another favorable trajectory for increasing polyandry. Well, where does this take us? Um, we're replicating this work right now in Georgia. I mentioned Brett's doing this. The, the trajectory of the data are very good. In the case of brood, they're significantly so. So we want to just do it again here in Georgia to look particularly at varroa mites and some of these other characters. But I think it raises big questions about how do we go about using genetics to improve our honeybees. And I think Polyandry is something we ought to look at more closely. There should be a question knocking around in the back of your head, and that is um, these characters that we select for, like hygienic, and like grooming, and like mite non-reproduction, and all these things, if they're so darn favorable, then why are they so hard to select for and keep? Hygienics. Hygienics are controlled by seven genes, and they're all recessive. 
you remember from your biology 101, you got dominant genes and you got recessive genes, and, and if you have just one dominant, then it masks the recessives. Well, in the case of hygienic genes, they're all recessive. Isn't that weird? Why is it recessive? Well, um, I'm not the first to think this and ask that. And in fact, there's been some work that's come out of Germany that has shed some interesting light on this. And they, they propose a theory on why this is so. Highly specialized and unique characters are predicted to be rare and recessive, according to the theory that they're working on. And the thinking goes like this. Because the character is so beneficial that it would rigidly lock that colony into just expressing that trait absolutely. And you could get too much of a good thing. And remember how I mentioned this morning about Marla Spivak and hygienic? She's done that before. She's gotten colonies that are too hygienic. Well, imagine a colony that just nukes every varroa mite that crosses its threshold, but at the expense of thermoregulation. And so they die every winter or they cannot forage for water as well, or they cannot rear worker jelly as well as the next can. You see what I'm saying? There's other characters that are more fundamental to the survival or death of the colony. And these other characters, in very special situations like Varroa, they can be so potent that they make the colony too genetically narrow at the expense of other alleles that are more necessary to the colony's growth. So these authors, his name is Stefan Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S, and Robin Moritz. And you might want to look up their paper where they talk about it. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? You would not think that. But they suggest that these rare, highly beneficial alleles are another one of the reasons that have pushed honeybees into multiple mating. So the model that emerges is that the honeybee is trying to cast a wide net and he says, I'm going to cast as wide a net as I can and hope that I get some of those rare beneficial alleles that are out there. But I don't want to do that at the expense of more fundamental things that I need. I don't want to be so genetically narrow that I'm vulnerable to environmental extremes. Um, this seems to be the best working model that we have right now about how the superorganism uses genetics to solve its own problems. And I have come to wonder, not only from my own failures and just the innate difficulty of breeding the honeybee, that maybe we just need to stop fighting it and try to embrace the biology of the animal rather than be blind to the biology of the animal and stop trying to treat it like a diploid organism that it is not. So what then would that mean for the beekeeper? I do not emphatically think that this is in opposition in any way, shape, or form to classical character-based selection of the kind that Sue Kobe is doing, Marla, Greg Hunt. Instead, what if we had a sort of a, a market of specialized readers who are producing drones? And what if there was a market for drones that could then be incorporated into highly polyandrous queens? It'd be sort of like front-loading the system with characters that you like. We want highly polyandrous queens, but yeah, I'm not going to complain if I get a lot of hygienic in there, too. So imagine if there were a variety of breeders selecting for their particular characters that they liked, but that the final product in the hands of the beekeeper to get a queen for those characters is also highly polyandrous. So it is not mutually exclusive to classical breeding it is a addition to classical breeding. I think far too long we have ignored polyandry at the expense of selection-based programs that are antithetical to the biology of the animal. Now, this is our queen mating yard in York. And if I were to turn around in a complete circle, I would show you this picture. That's how far apart our drone colonies were. Uh, they're just right there in the same apiary. I grant you that instrumental insemination is an obstacle uh, to most beekeepers or most beekeeper groups. I do not think it needs to be that way. I think there's a, a, an unjust, an unwarranted bias against instrumental insemination. I think it's something that can be practiced at the level of an association, uh, like some associations by extractors, 
and share it among your membership. I think it could be something like that. It could be made available if beekeepers had sufficient reason uh, to do it. But I do think it'd be nice if we could find simpler ways to increase polyandry using more conventional things like drone saturation. Now we do have some literature on the efforts at drone saturation, but to find any, I had to go back to the 1980s, this paper by uh, Rick Helmick. This is the Baton Rouge Bee Lab. And this was back in the days when African bees were all the thing. You see it's published there in 1988. And I was there at the time as a graduate student at LSU. And um, we had a research apiary in North Venezuela that was a 125,000% African. I mean, it was just saturated. And the question was, if we have a European apiary in an ocean of African bees, can we still get European to European matings if we saturate those apiaries with European drones? That was the interest back then. And so Rick, tell me, he had these three apiaries. I pasted this straight from his, his article. And the, the three histograms there on the right, at the top was a yard that had zero European drone source colonies. One in the middle had four drone source colonies. The bottom had seven. Where he came up with those numbers, I don't know. And then he put in European mating nukes, European virgins. And those, those stacked histograms are the percentage blocks in each category of successful European to European matings that he got. And it's a plain as day. The apiaries that had seven drone source colonies had much higher rates of European to European matings than that that, of course, had zero. This is simply mating with European with European. It has nothing whatsoever to do with polyandry. He was not interested in polyandry. He didn't measure polyandry. But I am wondering if this is a clue that through germ saturation we could influence polyandry. I would like to, to revisit this. I, I'm hoping to I'm be writing grants this winter during grant writing season uh, to try to get some uh, USDA funding to look at this in a systematic way if drone flooding can improve polyandry of resulting queens. I was giving these results at the um, ABRC in uh, what was it, San Antonio last winter, and I had an inspector, one of the inspectors from Arkansas came up to me, he said afterwards, can't you get what you're talking about just by swapping brood around? And I sit there kind of gawked at him for a minute, he said, just, just swapping brood? Yeah, just swap brood around. Yeah. I think he's on to something. Um, imagine if you just simply took brood from all your different colonies and just mixed it all up, or borrow brood from one another. Market going here, and just swap all your brood, and you end up with colonies that are genetically diverse. Um, yeah, they, that's brilliant. I I think I will steal his idea. Um, I'll probably include it in my proposal. But of course, the problem is it's not sustainable, is it? I mean, if you get a big explosion of polyandry, the and there's nothing there to keep the, keep the party rolling. Um, so I still think ultimately we want to look at the amount of drones represented in a queen spermatheca. That is ultimately what we need to address and get at. Um, we have shown in principle that you can do it with instrumental insemination. I would like to find a more beekeeper friendly way. Um, hopefully I will have that information in another year or two. I do want to also stress that um, people frequently ask me, well, shouldn't I therefore get queens from California one year, queens from Georgia the next, queens locally the year after that, queens from New York the year after that? Um, yes. I think the answer is yes. But it's still not the same thing. We're talking about the number of males in the queen spermatheca. That's what we're talking about. We want the colonies to be genetically diverse inside there. The Arkansas inspector may be right. He may be spot on. That may be the simplest way that we can capture this principle um, for practical beekeeping. So let me recap in our sabbatical work from England. We were able to show that 60 drone and 78 queens produced more brood per bee than 15 drone queens. And there were good trends for polyandry with mite production, comb construction, recruitment. I need to scratch out that stored pollen and honey. That was not true but for syrup recruitment there was. And that leaves us lingering with how can we exploit this principle for beekeeping. I also want to emphasize that this is not mutually exclusive. 
from classical selection-based programs, but I do think it is a natural addition to and culmination of these practices. I think it's also more consistent with the evolutionary history of the bee. It is the way Apis mellifera has used genetics to solve its problems. It does not want to be genetically narrow. It wants to be genetically diverse. We ought to try to partner with it, not fight with it. Right, our funders from Her Majesty's government, a little bit of help from the Good Beekeepers of Georgia. Thank you for your attention. Maybe we have some time for questions. Thank you.